Last Sunday, we began a series of sermons entitled Enduring Troubling Times. We're going to be studying from the lives and the writings of Jeremiah and David and James, for all of them were forced to endure troubling times, and they therefore have a message for us, which is good because we are enduring troubling times. As stated last week, this epidemic has negatively impacted our lives. It's been going on for over nine months now, and we're trying to adapt to those changes. We've, we've all suffered a lot of changes and a lot of loss in our lives. Some are suffering an even greater loss than that, just the inconvenience of the times. For many in our church family have suffered the loss of loved ones in these past six or eight months. Over 20 of our church families have lost either a sibling or a parent or a grandparent or, in a couple of cases, a child. And this has been a difficult time. Others of us are very uneasy about the civil unrest that we are seeing in our nation, as Jim referred to in his communion meditation. We have witnessed a a growing division and animosity. There's violence and vandalism and hateful words spoken. And it's on the part of both conservatives and liberals. These truly are troubling times. James has a message for us about that. As we saw last week from chapter 1, his message was, Endure your struggles with rejoicing. That's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? But perhaps his message to us from chapter 5 this morning is even more difficult. For he says there, endure your struggles with patience. Patience. Not a sermon on patience. Yes, it's perhaps the most difficult virtue that we have to master. Maybe you should be wearing this mask as a warning to others. You're on thin ice because my patience is thin, so just be careful. Or maybe the motto of your life is more like what the one is on this coffee cup. You are continually trying to acquire patience in your life. And so it's like this perpetual upload that never fully completes. You never really get there no matter how hard you try. Maybe you're different, however. Maybe you're like this dog who has mastered patience completely. What an admirable trait uh, or trick to teach uh, this dog. But maybe you're different. Maybe you're like this dog who is only patient when he has to be. And there are situations that we have to be patient. And so we force ourselves. But other than that, patience is not my virtue. We struggle with being patient. My biggest test of patience comes when I'm driving. Oh, I can't stand traffic, especially if the backup in traffic is a result of some stupid driver who did something just really idiotic. And I'm not alone in that. I think we all have some struggles with that. For psychologist Robert Levine suggested in his book, A Geography of Time, that we create a new unit of time, which he calls The honko second. The honko second is that period of time between the light turning green and the person behind you starting to lay on their horn. (laughs) Maybe you're guilty of inspiring the creation of that unit of time. Here's a patience test for you in traffic. You're sitting in a line of traffic at a toll booth. The driver ahead of you is involved in an extended conversation with the toll taker that goes on for a few minutes. Now, are you happy that they're celebrating this newfound friendship? Or does your patience begin to wear thin and you get a little angry and you start fantasizing about your car actually being a tank and you driving right over top of that vehicle and making your way down the road? I'm afraid I would fail that test. (laughs) We all struggle with patience. We hate waiting. Sometimes we have no choice, as this sign indicates, ear piercing while you wait. Now think about that. Do you have another option? I mean, it's not like you can drop them off and say, I'll pick them up next Thursday after they're pierced, right? 
Sometimes we're forced to be patient and we rise to the occasion demonstrating that we can when we really have to, but we don't like being patient. And so it's with some sense of resistance, perhaps, that we explore this message that James has for us today from James chapter 5 when he says, endure your struggles patiently. Let's look. James 5, verse 7. My friends, be patient until the Lord returns. Okay, put on the brakes right there. What? How long do I have to be patient until the Lord returns? I already don't like this scripture. My friend, be patient until the Lord returns. Think of farmers who wait patiently for the spring and summer rains to make their valuable crops grow. Now, maybe when James said, be patient until the Lord returns, what he was talking about was, be patient as long as you have to. Or more likely, he was saying, we are never going to fully be free of all of our struggles in life until Christ returns again and he ushers in his new kingdom. But until then, you have to patiently struggle through life. And we understand that. He teaches us in this passage of scripture that we'll study this morning to endure our struggles with the right attitude. The first of those is an attitude of determination. Let's move on to verse 8 in our text. Be patient like those farmers and don't give up. The Lord will soon be here. Don't give up, James writes. The New International Version says, stand firm. Those are words of determination. Be determined in your mind that you're not going to give up, that you're going to survive these struggles. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to hang in there and, 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 and do what you need to do to get through it. He uses the illustration of a farmer who works hard doing what he can. He plows the ground, he fertilizes it, he plants the seed, he cultivates the young plants as they, as they grow, and then there comes a point where his control over the situation stops, for he can't control the weather, and he must trust that God will send the rain in due season and nourish the crop and it will grow. He makes determ the determined efforts that he can make, and then he patiently waits. Last week, someone sent me a quote that they said had they memorized a long time ago, and through the years, it's been a source of motivation and inspiration for them. And here's what it says. The best things happen to those who make the best of what happens. I think that's true. I like that quote. And it kind of tells us what James is telling us, doesn't it? We must do what we can to resolve a problem. We must be determined in those efforts. But there comes a point that we will have to turn it over to God, and it becomes his problem, and we wait patiently for him to deal with it. And when we come to that point, James makes us a promise. He said, as we saw in that last verse, the Lord's coming is near. Now, that's an obvious reference to the return of Christ someday to our world, the second coming, we call it. But also, it is true that the Lord's coming to our aid in our time of need is near. And that's a promise that we can count on. And so, James encourages us to have not only an attitude of determination, but a positive spirit. Let's move on in our text to verse 9. Don't grumble about each other or you will be judged. The judge is right outside the door. Our impatience is often directed toward others, isn't it? And we might grumble. We'll grumble about what someone did or about what someone didn't do or about what someone didn't do as fast as we think they should have done it. And we'll grumble and we'll point fingers and we'll blame them for our misery. But our grumbling is self-defeating because it in itself adds to our misery, doesn't it? When we grumble, we remind ourselves over again how terrible our circumstances are. 
When we grumble about another person and what misery they brought into our lives and how unjustly perhaps we were treated, we just wallow in that misery even more. Grumbling is an easy rut for us to fall into. Especially if we have an ally who sympathetically accommodates our grumbling. That person may think they are being a good friend by providing a listening ear, by being supportive of us as we vent. But that person is really helping us to continue wallowing in our bitterness. A good friend will correct our toxic ways. That's why Solomon wrote this in Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted because they're for our own good. A good friend might tell us when we grumble about another person, I'm sorry you are hurt, but it was probably unintentional. A good friend might say, consider this from all perspectives before rushing to judgment. A good friend might encourage us, let's talk through this so that you can find healing. A good friend might say, be patient. See where this goes before rushing to a conclusion. You see, a good friend will help us develop a positive spirit. Because a positive spirit is our best weapon against misery. That's why the scriptures encourage us to be joyful in so many places. Here are a couple of them, just for example. Proverbs 15, 15. All the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Nehemiah 8, 10. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach. A positive spirit helps us to endure patiently. And James teaches us to endure our struggles with the right attitude. And then he instructs us to also endure our struggles with a confident faith. The faith, first of all, that God will deliver us. Let's look at that in verse 10 and the first part of verse 11. My friends, follow the example of of the prophets who spoke for the Lord. They were patient even when they had to suffer. In fact, we consider the ones who endured to be blessed. The prophets were God's Old Testament spokesmen who carried his message to his people. They oftentimes suffered difficulty as a result of their ministry. Ezekiel, for example. God told him that he had an important message that he wanted him to deliver on a specific day. On that very day, Ezekiel's wife passed away. And God said, I want you to put your grief on hold because this message is too important for my people not to hear it. And God gave him the strength to carry out his duty that day. And then he was able to grieve the loss of his wife. Hosea was another of God's prophets who suffered during his ministry. His wife left him to become a prostitute. She left him with three children to raise on his own. He must have been terribly hurt and very bitter. And yet God instructed him to pursue her and to woo her and to take her back and to love her again because God said, I want your relationship with her to be an object lesson of my love for my unfaithful people. It is enduring. And God gave him the capacity in his heart to do that. Jeremiah was another example and one of God's prophets who suffered during his ministry. His his message to the people was very simple, and over and over again he preached it, repent or perish. But it was also an unpopular message, and he was rejected 
by his countrymen and even his own family members. He spent the duration of his 50 years being alone, never invited to social events, never befriended, always treated as an outcast. But God gave him the strength to carry out his 50-year ministry in his loneliness. Hebrews 11 says about these faithful servants and others like them in the Old Testament period, they were destitute, they were persecuted, they were mistreated, and yet they patiently endured, waiting for God's deliverance because they were men and women of faith. Patience is easier to endure or to have when we are men and women of faith. Many parents and wives have waited for long periods of time when their sons or husbands went off to war. Some of you have experienced that kind of patient waiting. What keeps us patiently waiting for our soldiers' return? It's because we have the faith that they will return. And that faith gives us the strength to endure our soldiers' absence. I know because I was one of those parents. James gives us the encouragement in this scripture to do the same. You be patient, he writes. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And we can trust in that. So trust in God and patiently endure through your struggles in life. He will deliver you. And have that faith also that God will not only deliver you, but he will bless you. We read that in the rest of verse 11, which says, You remember how patient Job was and how the Lord finally helped him. The Lord did this because he is so merciful and kind. Perhaps no one in the history of humanity suffered more than Job did. He lost his entire estate and all of his businesses worth millions of dollars. He lost all ten of his children in a freak accident. He lost his health as he was covered from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet in painful boils. He was suffering so miserably that his wife wished that he would die so that he could escape his suffering. But Job didn't give up. And he didn't give up on his faith in God. Oh, he felt sorry for himself. And he wondered why he was struggling, why he was suffering. But he didn't allow himself to wallow in his misery for long. For he wrote, spoke these words as recorded in Job 1.21. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And he spoke these words in Job 13.15. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. And he spoke these words in Job 23.10. He knows my ways. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And because of his faith and his patient endurance, God blessed him. God blessed Job with twice as much as he lost. He'd had a huge herd of 7,000 sheep that he lost. God gave him 14,000 sheep after his period of suffering was over. He lost 3,000 camels in his transportation industry. God blessed him with 6,000 camels. He lost 500 yoke of oxen in his farming industry. God blessed him with 1,000 yoke of oxen. He lost 10 children. And God blessed him with 10 more. You might wonder why God didn't bless him with 20 children in keeping with doubling the blessing. Maybe it's because having 20 children is not really a blessing. <laughs> Maybe it's more of a struggle and God assumed that he had struggled enough already. 
Or more likely it is that Job didn't really lose his first 10 children. For he would be reunited with them in heaven one day. The point is, we must patiently endure and wait for God's blessing to come. James tells us that God will deliver us just as he delivered the prophets. And he will bless us just as he blessed Job if we patiently endure. We have his promise on that. Glenn Wheeler was a Christian church minister in Columbus, Ohio for many years. A few decades ago, his wife passed away. He wrote an article about it, about his dealing with his grief in the Christian Standard magazine. I saved that article, and I've read it a few times over the years since then because it's such an inspiration to me. He wrote how he missed her companionship and her encouragement the most. He said she would often tell me on a Sunday after worship services, you're a good man, Glenn Wheeler. He described how that lifted him. He said, I would love to hear her say that one more time. He wrote how he also missed her cooking. She was a great cook and especially a great baker. And he said he missed that she would sometimes say as she was clearing the dishes from the table at the evening meal, Hold on to your fork, Glenn. He said, I knew what that meant. She had baked some special dessert, and I was going to enjoy it, and the best was yet to be. He said, I would love to hear her say that to me one more time. And then he concluded the article by saying, Sometimes when I am alone and I am hurting, it's as if I hear the voice of God saying to me, Hold on to your fork, Glenn, for the best is yet to be. And he said that gave him the strength to endure. And so it does for us. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Galatians 6, 9. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So don't allow your struggles to overwhelm you, whatever they are. Patiently endure them as you wait for the Lord to bring deliverance and blessing upon blessing. Trust in Him and continue on in His work. For the Lord will come to your aid and bring about His will in His timing. And remember, especially in your struggles... For us as Christians, it is true that the best is always yet to be.